This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. You hear the expression, we are in the end times, or the last days. You hear it fairly frequently in the Christian culture and then in the general culture. In fact, I was watching a, like a couple of minutes of a morning news, entertainment, whatever show you want to call it in the mainstream media. And they had some band playing in the morning after the Academy Awards ceremony. And I, I didn't know the name of the band. Um, and somebody asked the, the lead singer uh, a male uh, question. And he said something to, to the effect that uh, it's the end times or it's the end time. Now. Um, in reference to the band's music. And what was interesting is that uh, I don't think the band or this particular singer, performer was a Christian or someone who would be described as a Bible-believing Christian, but that he chose to use the word we're in the end time or the end times. And there are a number of, of you know, big hit uh, secular uh, musical songs that make reference to the things like it's the end of the world and uh, it's the, the end times or it's the last days um, and it's either it's performed in a parody with a kind of a sarcasm or it's kind of stated as a a general, a generalized, nebulous fact, but the point is, there's a reference to the end times, the end time, or the last days, and you hear that also um, occasionally in the conversations of people, both adults and young adults, etc., who would not be classified as um, religious, and it's amazing how people can have. Uh, multiple uh, belief systems simultaneously that are apparently contradictory. These are belief systems that are apparently in conflict with one another. But, you know, who said that the mind is rational? I mean, people would like the human mind to be rational or logical, but it isn't. It never has been. The human mind is a combination of many factors. Logic only plays a small role. And that's if people choose to be logical and rational. Most often people are emotional or they're driven by forces that they don't even understand subconsciously. Or they are irrational and, and energized by emotional responses, etc., etc. So when people in our culture and in the pop culture, in the mainstream media, in the entertainment culture, on one hand, a lot of people don't even know what they believe or why they believe. Some people will articulate it for you if pressed. But many people just have a belief system that doesn't really, it, it's, not, uh, it's not necessarily a coherent belief system. It, it, it's a belief system which, if you really analyze it, believes in or embraces contradictory beliefs. So on one hand, there's this like generalized belief, we're here by evolutionary accident. But you see, when you talk to the average man or woman, and, and even those who claim to be have some kind of status because of their education, you you will not always hear this uniform answer that you know this this belief in in evolution there's kind of a there's like part of them believes that and then part of them kind of believes this the rational mixture of ideas so even if they're like people who are very very concerned about climate change you will be surprised how often they will connect climate change with um, the end of the world, the, the end times, or the end time, or whatever. And, and people will 
subconsciously and consciously, and even young people in very large numbers, will will hear in the media and through the internet about you know this whole litany of cataclysmic events like you know the coronavirus and warfare and the potential of nuclear warfare and biological warfare and conventional warfare and earthquakes and famines and uh, mass slaughter and the the hypersonic societal changes we're experiencing in terms of the culture and in, in terms of uh, every aspect of the culture changing constantly. And many people will will who are not religious will say it's the end time or the end times or the last days and and then just continue on. It's like there's almost an unconscious or a subconscious acknowledgement that people on a mass level are making the appraisal while not necessarily going all the way with their belief system, but they're making the appraisal that, hey, there's something very different about the time period we live in versus the time period that other people and peoples lived in in previous ages. People are making that observation. And then, somewhat irrationally, saying it's because it's the end times. And then, of course, they don't really process that they don't really do do much about it they just kind of like think about it for a moment and, and keep going so what does all that mean i think what it means is that people deep down inside in a far despite all the statistics and the data that you've heard uh, me uh, talk about on this program the paul mcguire report despite the fact that there is data and polls that that I think are very accurate about what people believe, you know, the the rising level of atheism, etc., or the the rising level of uh, witchcraft, etc. Despite these beliefs, which I believe are the product of accurate measurements, the one thing the polls don't take into account is the irrational nature of people's beliefs. In other words, a lot of people can hold these set beliefs that people measure, but at the same time believe the opposite or other things simultaneously. And people do it all the time. So that's why you hear this repetitive acknowledgement among people who don't subscribe to a religion, Christian religion officially, or don't subscribe to Bible prophecy officially but they kind of acknowledge it. And it leaks out, and it slips out in the cultural conversation and entertainment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think deep down inside, there is an inner knowing among very, very, very large numbers of people in the United States of America and around the world, there's a, the, this inner knowing or sense that something is happening on a far larger level that is of paramount importance. They can't quite put their finger on it, but they have this intuitive sense that it's like the, the end of times or the end times or the, or the last days. They're, they're not even sure precisely what that means. But they have a sense of it. And, you know, when we look at that, I think that that is partially due to the work of the Holy Spirit moving on people. I think that is partially due to the amount of Bible prophecy teaching and Bible prophecy uh, thoughts and beliefs being disseminated into the mass culture in the United States and around the world. It may be censored, quote, officially by the mainstream media, but there, there remains this constant undercurrent uh, below the surface. There remains this constant undercurrent of interest, speculation, curiosity, and acknowledgement 
of or about the end times and the last days and Bible prophecy and the book of Revelation and so on and so forth. And, and the evidences of that keep bubbling up. So, for example, you have the History Channel and other channels uh, continually doing series of programming and series of programs that have to do with, like, the end of the world, Bible prophecy, the apocalypse, Armageddon, the last days, the end, end times. Could continue, And these are the most popular shows, among the most popular shows that they do. <clears throat> so whether or not the mainstream media covers it is really irrelevant, because the accumulation of, of mass audiences is, is massive. These, these shows and programs, <clears throat> like the History Channel has done, uh, have massive numbers of people watching, and then they air it over and over and over again, and, people, and, and millions watch it over and over and over again. I was on uh, two different History Channel series <clears throat> that had to do with the apocalypse, um, the End Times, uh, Armageddon, two different series, and they would, uh, I was one of the main guests, and um, they would air these series over and over and over again for years, um, decades, and then People can still watch them if they go to the History Channel sites and, and type in, in, in the uh, titles. So there's a constant numerical watching of that. And then, of course, they, they put out new programming. I did a thing for the Discovery Channel, I guess it was about a year ago, on the Mark of the Beast and the uh, uh, Antichrist. So again, this mass, and, and everybody in the room, with the exception of me, the host of the show, the producers, I remember uh, going into the production offices of the production company that was <clears throat> producing the uh, series for um, the Discovery Channel, and they wanted to talk to me about the mark of the beast and uh, the microchip implant. And they had heard my name by searching the internet. And they saw my name connected to books I had written, like my book. Uh, what is the name of that book? One of my books on Bible prophecy, which was called Are You Ready for the Microchip? And other books that I've written, which deal with the microchip. And so the Producers and researchers were interested. Then the host of the show became interested. So I went into Hollywood, and uh, <clears throat> they taped me for hours and uh, uh, asked me questions over and over again from all different angles. And there were all kinds of producers and writers in the room, <clears throat> the host, the director. And they had this. Uh, they knew in their gut that there was a huge interest in their audience, even though it's a secular show, secular network, but they, they had that intuitive knowing and they're right that there's, there's a, there's a huge audience that is interested in not only Bible prophecy, but they're interested in things like the mark of the beast and the microchip implant, huge interest. Because again, People, if it's, if it's just through like rumors in the culture, have heard about the end of the age, the last days, and stuff like that. So the point is that on one hand, you have like this official denial of Bible prophecy and all that stuff. But on the other hand, you have, again, this undercurrent of a never-ending interest in this topic. And I believe that's due to the fact that in, in people's guts and through the action of the Holy Spirit, they know deep inside that there's something true about it. In fact, it is true. And they're secretly afraid of it, and they're secretly curious about it, and, and uh, because God put, wired them that way. 
And like I said, they've heard enough Bible prophecy teaching. You know, like salt. Salt, you sprinkle salt on, on meat or whatever food and it and it changes the flavor. Jesus said that, you know, that the church, hopefully preaching the word, hopefully preaching the word which includes Bible prophecy, the prophetic word, the book of Revelation, etc. That's the church functioning as salt and light. And Jesus re- rebukes the church that if it loses its saltiness or its faithfulness to the word, if it loses its savor or flavor, then salt becomes good for nothing and it's just thrown out in the garbage or tossed under your feet. And that if the church loses its ability to shine the light of God's word, then um, <clears throat> it's good for nothing. And Christ rebukes that. So the church is supposed to function as um, salt and light with the truth. So when people faithfully communicate Bible prophecy um, and shine the light of Christ and shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it flavors, it takes a little bit of spice, a little bit of light. A little bit of light illuminates the whole room. A little bit of a certain spices like salt flavors the entire meal that you put the salt on. And so it is with bi- the, the, the dissemination of truth from ministries such as this one and others which teach and preach and minister on Bible prophecy. It spreads out there. You know, for decades I've been writing articles that have spread virally and with millions of people reading them. And they often would have sci-fi sounding titles, kind of sci-fi mixed with Bible prophecy titles, etc. And it was done on purpose. It was done on purpose by me to, to do an end run around bias and censorship. And <clears throat> uh, the articles that I wrote, and by the way, you can read, I think, all of these articles or many of these articles at the website paulmcguire.us for free. There's articles and pictures and stuff. And and virally, these uh, articles have been read by millions and millions of people over the years. And so what that does, along with what other people are doing, is it's it's spreading salt and light into the mass culture. Because with the articles, I would allow people to post them on their websites or or social media sites, etc., as long as they were uh, honest enough to give me the credit for the article and link it to our ministry. And therefore, it would spread virally, and that's why millions of people uh, have read them. But the ironic thing is, you would write them, and sometimes they would deal with. when I wrote them, nobody was writing about it, like, like you know, <clears throat> going back decades and writing about, you know, the Nazis and occult secret societies and stuff and all kinds of, at, th- at that time when I wrote it decades ago, it was hardly anybody was writing it. Just a few people were writing on that subject. And then you, you slowly find it, it, it working itself into Hollywood movies and scripts and episodic television shows. And then that spreads into the mass culture as salt and light. Now the the Hollywood screenwriters are writing it for pure entertainment value. But, you, you know, I know a lot of Hollywood screenplay writers. And uh, I also know where they get their research. <laughs> they go on the internet. They read articles, etc., or they read books, and they cherry pick stuff. You know, so it's like, where, where do they get the ideas for some of their shows? Well, I believe a lot of the articles I've written seeded the ideas for many shows and films, and I believe that the the, the work that a few others did uh, way back when seeded Hollywood with. Um, 
shows and film ideas. Now, no, they didn't preach the gospel with it, but they did mention things like the mark of the beast and the battle between Satan and God and all kinds of stuff. And there's certain stuff that I know came from my research. Because when I wrote that stuff decades ago, you couldn't find it anywhere uh, by searching on the internet. It was non-existent. Certain, not, certain categories of research, certain names, certain topics were uh, not uh, available to people. You couldn't find it anywhere. And I'm not saying that I'm the only one, but I'm one of a number of people, a few people, who did some really esoteric research and discovered things that now are all over the place and in many people's books. Um, but back then, they were nowhere. And so when they appeared, you know where they got the information from because they would use the language that was, that was very unique and particular that you put in your articles. And again, I'm not claiming to be the only person uh, who, who they rated their, their material from. There are others uh, who researched into the esoteric and, and looked where nobody else was looking <clears throat> and uh, get, gave these people ideas. And can you do anything about it? No, it's probably not even worth trying to pursue. It's just out there. The internet had kind of just sucks up information everywhere and distributes information everywhere. And uh, the idea uh, uh, of trying to preserve, I mean, you can copyright books, but ideas and stuff are stolen all the time on the internet, especially by people. Uh, in Hollywood and the mainstream media. But, you know, it's like, okay, so you know where they got their ideas. In the, in, in, in the long run, <clears throat> I made it available to them, you know. By, by, but the only thing is they, they don't keep the, the, the end of the bargain in the sense they'll use a lot of your material <clears throat> but never give you reference, whatever. That, that to me is... Uh, dishonest because uh you know i could have copyrighted everything and i have copyrighted a lot of stuff but um that's where it gets to be a little bit dishonest but in in the long run if if this work leads people to christ if it leads people to pick up the bible even though that's not the intention of these writers but the material I'm researching was always based on a biblical worldview. And so if it leads people, and it has, the most amazing thing to discover is that you can talk to so many young people today, millennials, a little bit older than millennials, and, and, and the younger generation before millennials, and I cannot tell you the amount of obscure times uh, well, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe God orders our feet, the steps of our feet. But, you know, like I've shared with you before, I, like, I deliberately get into conversations with people everywhere as a form of research because I want to stay in touch with what the average person is thinking. So if time permits, I, I strike up conversations with people. Because what I'm really doing is I'm probing for feedback or information. That's the only way you can really, really stay in touch with the culture. If you're trying to stay in touch with the culture through mainstream media, that's a, a distorted mirror. You know, like years and years ago, there used to be these, uh, I forgot what you would call them, theme park, well, you know, like theme parks, and then they would have these mirrors. Now they use uh, computer imagery and stuff, which is far more effective. But years ago, they had distorted mirrors, and the idea is you look at yourself in these mirrors, and it would make your face wide or make you long, and people thought that was hilarious. So if you're looking to the mainstream media to give you an accurate 
reflection of reality. It's always distorted, like in a fun house or a theme park or whatever, like those mirrors. So I was, I was uh, in an elevator speaking at a Bible prophecy conference in uh, North Dakota. And I was getting into the elevator and I, um, I'm, al- I'm always aware of like what's in an elevator. I know that sounds like incredibly stupid, but I'll explain why. I grew up in an apartment building with an elevator. I mean, I I grew up in New York City. Elevators were everywhere. Everybody had elevators or or was in elevators. It was a constant. Most places that you will be raised in or live in, with the exception of some of the bigger cities, which also have elevators everywhere, most people did not grow up in a in a where elevators were everywhere unless they grew up in one of those big cities and there's a bunch of big cities where elevators are everywhere new york city is one so um a lot of people grew up in areas where there's hardly any very minimal elevator usage well every day i'd be walking into the elevator in the apartment building we lived in because that would take you where, I mean, you could walk up the, the, the stairs, but every day I'd be in the elevator, you know, constantly going up, going down, or visiting somebody else in some other apartment building, going up, going down, or whatever. So you, you, you're you bored in an elevator. When you spend that much time in an elevator, simply because you're always in an elevator going up or down, if you, if you grow up in New York City like I did, or a big city, uh, as you know, if you've ever waited for an elevator, elevator if in the hotel or whatever, elevators are boring. And being stuck in an elevator, as it sometimes can be slowly stopping at all these uh, floors, is very boring. So one of the aspects of using an elevator is you're bored. Because remember, when I grew up in, in a day of elevators, we didn't have earbuds in our ears and we weren't listening to music from our... Uh, cell phone or whatever so we were just purely bored so um the point is that in your boredom you you do dumb things like you stare at the 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 buttons the lights on the buttons in the elevator hoping the elevator will will speed up okay so uh then also you uh, um, stare in boredom at all, all the switches and kind of like you're studying them, like the alarm switch and the um, emergency stop button and the, you know, automatically open the doors button and all these little weird funky buttons. And you also, in your boredom, I'm talking about my boredom, you stare at the logo because you've got nothing else to do. You're staring at the, remember, you're standing looking forward to where the doors slide open. And on the left and right of, of, of that elevator are, are, is the panel and the logo of, of the company that made the uh, elevator. And I forgot, I just spaced out and forgot the name of the elevator company that made the elevator. But it, it was one of the most famous elevator companies in the world in the fact that. Just about every elevator I would ever ride in in New York City was made by the same company, or even in other places, it was made by the same company. And I don't want to say the one that's coming to my mind unless I'm sure I'm right. So you're bored. So you so at that time, I could have told you the name of the elevator company. So anyway, I get into the elevator in the hotel, speaking at a Bible prophecy conference in North Dakota. And I'm bored, waiting inside the elevator, of course, staring at the panel. But I notice the logo, okay? And the logo, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to not give you the name for legal reasons. It's not the company that, that, that was so huge that I saw as a kid. Let's just put it this way. It was a German company with a German name and a German logo. Now, the company, I had recognized it has a huge name. 
it's a gigantic German conglomerate. But as I looked at the logo, and, and uh, you know, only somebody like me who researches occult symbolism and things like that, and the, 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 the occult nature of the secret occult societies that put the Nazis in power, which, you know, I know a lot about. So I'm looking at the logo, and I happen to notice it has a German name to the company, which I recognize, and the actual logo has a hidden, not hidden, it's an, it's a, the logo is a occultic symbol, okay? And the, and the name of the company is, is, is also involved with the Nazis, if you go back in history. So, one of the, uh, I don't know, uh, young men who worked in the, in the, at the hotel, I don't know what he did, but he, got in, he, he had a uniform or button or something on him, and, and we got in the elevator as we were going up, and I'm staring at this logo, and I strike up a conversation with him. As, as we're in the elevator, because we're staring. So I said, you, you see that logo of the elevator? He, he goes, yes. I said, do you know what that means? And then he smiles at me, like with this all-knowing smile. And he goes, yep, you know, I certainly do. And I said, well, what does it mean? And so he tells me exactly the occult Nazi nature of this logo. Now, I guarantee you I could ask that question to people who were older than him. And 99% of them probably wouldn't know what that logo meant. He knew what it meant. And I've had similar conversations where the, what, used to be obscu- uh, what used to be called or labeled obscure conspiracy theory type information is known by growing numbers of young people who have been growing up on the internet reading alternative media and being curious, and they know about all kinds of stuff that I write about and others write about, that, that uh, decades before you would just be dismissed as a conspiracy theorist. And it's not, this is not like finding a, a relatively tiny number of people who know all these things. I, I'm, what I've determined from just casual conversations is that, that there are most likely millions of people in the United States, primarily younger generations, who have a curiosity, who know all kinds of what we would call conspiracy theory type information, they know about it, unlike uh, older generations. I'm not going to go through every circumstance, but it happens constantly. Didn't, and by the way, this kind of stuff didn't happen 10 years ago. Going back 10 years ago, it, this did not happen. There's been a social revolution, and it, the, the mainstream media doesn't acknowledge it. And, and they, they, don't, they pretend it doesn't exist, but there's been a social revolution due to the information provided by alternative media on the Internet. Now here's another example. So I talk to the... Uh, we, there's a, uh, uh, a food retailer, Trader Joe's. They're, they're national. I don't, I don't know if they are where you live, but they're popular in a lot of states. And people think they're expensive. They're not expensive. You just have to shop around and look for deals, just like at any other store. But they do carry a, lo- a lot more healthy food and a lot of. Uh, non-GMO, genetically modified organism food. So, so their food is healthier. Now, some people say, oh, it's expensive. No, it isn't. You just got to learn how to shop. If you, just, if you just walk into the store blindly and you don't shop, you know, look at the price and compare it to something else, yeah, you could, you could spend money, a lot, uh, more money. But the place is not expensive. That's a complete myth. It, that's, when people tell me that, I laugh to myself because I say they don't know how to shop. Um, you compare. You don't buy the most expensive brand of peanut butter that the store offers. So, and they're not like, well, let's say, what is it Whole Earth, which is pricey. 
which is expensive. So I talked to the, uh, the, the cashier girl as, she, as she's ringing up the food. And then I also ended up talking to the bagging girl who's, who's putting it in uh, bags or whatever. And I always begin my conversations very nonchalantly, very light. And, and I wait to see the response. And based on the response, I determine whether it's a red light or a green light. And, and will I ask a little probing questions? Because I'm looking for information. Um, what I'm looking for is what does the average person in different areas of our society, etc., what do they know about what's going on? What do they think? What's their consciousness about? See, that's the only way as a communicator and a writer and a speaker and a talk show host and et cetera, et cetera, that I can, the only way I can communicate with people is you have to know people outside your, you have to know what people think and interact with all kinds of people outside of your circles Okay, you gotta you gotta deliberately go outside of your circles in every possible way you can to listen to people and talk to people. And I do it everywhere, all over the place. I mean, not 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 like an obsessive, not to the point of obsession, but I do it in in rhythm or when I when you know the door opens. I mean, if I'm not gonna sit there and strike up a conversation with somebody who looks like they're ready to explode with their temper. I mean, that would be ridiculous. So I, I don't even finish my sentence. I forgot what we're talking about. We're talking about GMO foods, genetically modified organism uh, foods, where they've messed with the DNA of the food, and there's toxins and poisons in it. And uh, most people don't know, and they're eating GMO foods. And then they're wondering why they're dying from any number of diseases. Or, or being harmed by any number of diseases. So the, the girl cashier, I don't know what her ed- education was. I didn't ask. But the point is, she, she was fully aware of the dangers of GMO foods. Okay, that's interesting, because you can talk to some people that don't even know a G- what a GMO food is. But then the bagging girl interrupted, and she blurted out these words. She said, they're trying to kill us. I said, no, I'm sorry, what did you say? She said, they're trying to kill us. And, and I said, oh, I played dumb. So I said, well, what, what do you mean? And so she understood. She, she wasn't familiar with the term euthanasia, but she understood that there was a game plan by the elite to kill off mass population by a whole wide spectrum of stealth means. Okay, that's a really heavy thing to understand and would have been outright rejected by a middle class or upper middle class uh, person, uh, especially of a white race. They would have, would, would have screamed at you. That's a conspiracy theory. And I actually gotten angry. I, I didn't bring, bring any of this up, by the way. They brought it up. The bagging girl brought it up. So... I was very careful about what I said, but I recognized she fully understood the game plan of the elite. And I said, well, how do you know that stuff? She says, well, I read it. I read it on the internet. So, so I'm giving you two examples. But I could, and I'm not, uh, give you countless examples of similar conversations in which it's obvious that the knowledge level of especially younger people, actually, you could call them pre-millennials, is very, very, uh, they have a high level of knowledge about conspiratorial type things, etc. You say, why is it important? It is important because so many of the topics of what, what is meant in disparagement when people say conspiracy theory. So many of those topics are are door openers, conversation starters, or linked 
heavily to areas of Bible prophecy, Jesus Christ, the second coming, the tribulation period, the book of Revelation, and on and on and on. So, to me, when I, to me, it's not oh conspiracy theory because a lot of them, you know a huge percentage of conspiracy theories there are some wacky ones, but the core conspiracy theories are basically true. But the other thing is why they are of interest is because they're connected to Bible prophecy. So, what goes along with this knowledge by this, these gener- generations that come before the millennial generation, and even now it's the millennial generation and a little bit older, it's not just that they're interested, it's not just that they know about conspiracy theories, but they are also aware to varying degrees of the link that these conspiracy theory things have to things like the end of the age, the end of the world, the end times, the end of the last days, etc., etc. You see, they are links. This con- what, what, what are falsely called conspiracy theories are really links and bridges to interest or knowledge or curiosity about Bible prophecy topics. Okay? And that's right here where it's like it's like the California gold rush. It's like discovering the mother load, except it, it's not only in California because I, I fly all around the country to speak at prophecy conferences and uh, for other reasons and talk to people everywhere. I talk to people from foreign countries in the airport and I use the same approach. And it's, oh, it's amazing the percentage of foreigners from all nations who have a far higher awareness of what, what are called conspiracy theories. The number of people from foreign nations, I'm talking about from all the nations, is usually far higher in knowledge of conspiracy theories than Americans. Americans are very like. Insulated, walls off from what's really happening. So, um, what this means is they, this is why, like, these History Channel shows on the end of the world and Armageddon and the apocalypse do so well, and all this other stuff. Same thing with episodic TV and, and, and stuff like that. Because it all connects to stuff like. Here, let me just fire out some words, okay? I'm going to just randomly, spontaneously, uh, flow of consciousness, fire out some words to you and, and recognize that every one of the words that I'm using is connected to Bible prophecy in a significant way. So, for example, globalism equals book of Revelation, one world government. Globalism equals Babylon, ancient Babylon equals globalism. Um, Mark of the Beast equals microchip implant, nanochip implant, biochip implant. Hive mind, world brain equals antichrist government. Mark of the Beast technology. Um, Biological plagues. World War III, Armageddon, Apocalypse, all equal like man-made biological plagues and the plagues in the Book of Revelation. Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon in the Book of Revelation and geopolitical conflicts and and warfare in the Middle East, Israel, etc. See, I just named a few things and they're connected. uh, witchcraft, sorcery, psychedelic mind-altering drugs, Book of Revelation. And we could go on and on and on. These things are, are tied to 
key topics in the book of Revelation. Key topics in the book of Revelation. So, he, there's an open door as you continue to talk to these people, which I have and do. Depending upon the situation, I will take the next step and, and, and introduce to them Bible prophecy. Or the Bible prophecies themselves. Or, or what the book of Revelation says about the mark of the beast. What the mark of the beast is or Armageddon, or all kinds of things. In other words, the conspiracy theory conversation can easily be guided into an opportunity to present biblical truth, especially regarding Bible prophecy. And instead of there being anger and resistance and a stone wall and disbelief and defiance, which was the case the majority of times, 10 years ago, and still is the case among, sadly to say, middle class, often white people, have the hardest heart. You know why? Now, I'm, not ba- I'm not bashing white people. I'm white, in case you haven't figured it out. I'm not bashing white people. I'm just telling you that the relative affluence that some, not all, but that some people in the middle class have, has made them very hard-hearted to Jesus. That's why they're, they're into the seeker-friendly type of stuff, okay? The hard-heartedness. They're not hungry for Jesus because they, they think they don't need him. And that's a tragedy, but it's true. And it's not just the white race that can be hard-hearted. There are other races that, that have the tendency to be hard-hearted to Jesus, depending upon their sociological conditions. But I found that these younger generations, when you introduce Bible prophecy as a means to introduce Jesus to them, and then if the Lord, I never force it, I wait for the leading of the Lord, and then if the leading of the Lord uh, allows me to talk to them about Christ and the need for salvation and stuff, then I'll proceed. And then sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes I will lead people to the Lord. But the point is, the red lights aren't flashing. There's green lights flashing in the interactions with these people. That represents a significant change regarding the way people think and believe over, let's say, 10 years ago. The hunger for God, for Jesus, has increased, and it, 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 part of it is the, the searching for truth via certain conspiracy th- theory uh, things is, is really a signal, not in all cases, but in many cases, it's a signal that, that the individual is looking for answers and looking for truth. And people who are really looking for answers and really looking for truth are not going to reject the name of Jesus or Jesus Christ or Bible prophecy. And you can put little floating remarks out there to test the waters. You'll be surprised, depending upon how you act. I mean, if you act like a jerk, people are, not, are going to not, you're not going to see any response. But if you just act friendly and real and don't put on an act, um, people warm, you know this, people warm up to you. So, there's a hunger out there. So, when Jesus Christ said the words, that the fields are white for harvest, but the laborers are few, I believe that applies to the last days. And the secular world, even to a large percentage, weirdly enough, acknowledges that we're in the last days. So, the fields are white for harvest. That means. There's people all over the U.S. and all over the world who, if you scratch beneath the surface, are really ready to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They want to hear the truth. Now, these same people are not interested in religion or somebody on a religious trip, including they're not interested in the Christian religion either, but they are interested in biblical truth and in Jesus. 
if you present it in a real way. And they're hungry for God. I shared the story with you of being, again, in Trader Joe's. And let's see. In this particular visit to Trader Joe's, it's all shopping stories. Uh, I walked into the store, and they have a particular area in the store where they serve you. It's a little mini cup of free coffee. And they want to give you a sample of the different coffees they have. So, so, and they do stuff there like that. I like that. To me, it's like, I like to go to a place that gives me free coffee or free samples of hors d'oeuvres or whatever, cheese and crackers or whatever. And uh, plus the, 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 the staff in the store is not uptight and they don't act like a bunch of robots like, like a lot of the big retailers. So anyway, um, I go over to get the free coffee. As I'm on my way to get that little tiny cup of free coffee, some guy kind of moves in front of me to, to get a cup of free coffee. He, he, I don't think he saw me coming. He cut me off, so no big deal. He, he recognizes it, and, and he starts to stop, and I motion with my hand for him to go ahead, you know, go ahead and get the coffee. I'll wait. No big deal. Okay. <clears throat> but, but in the meantime, there's somebody else finishing getting their cup of coffee. So we strike up a conversation. He may have started. I may have started. I don't know. And in any case, within about five minutes, and I did nothing to manipulate anything. Okay. I had no agenda. I was really preoccupied with, with, shopping list so i didn't manipulate anything within five minutes our conversation began to get intense him talking about his life and stuff he wasn't on drugs or anything i i I can only in retrospect analyze that the lord was secretly in um maneuvering the conversation because it got down to the nitty-gritty very quickly and I wasn't manipulating it and the and the guy the younger the young guy I was talking to who looked like he was about 32 years old wasn't manipulating it and it turns out he shares with me that he used to be uh one of the biggest I think he said meth dealers in in the entire state of California and uh he talked to me a little bit about it, and I asked him some questions about it, because he said he used to be, and he was obviously not high on anything. So, And uh, it turned out that he started dealing the drugs, you know, as a young kid, because he was using it, and then he began selling it, and, and it's amazing how the devil can give people Download. It's amazing how the devil can download like instantaneous business entrepreneur talents into certain people when they're doing the devil's business. So this is this is a guy who's a meth addict, but he's also I don't know what kind of business training or if he had any business training. He he, he obviously created some kind of organization and had some kind of staff, or you wouldn't have been, been the largest. Uh, methamphetamine dealer in the state of California for, I forgot how many years he said he was. And I don't believe he was bluffing or lying. Whatever the case is, you just, when you've met a lot of people from a lot of different areas of life, like I have, and like many of you have, you get the sense of when people are lying and when people are telling the truth. And when people are telling the truth in something outrageous like this, you kind of sense it's not bragging and stuff. So. Uh, the devil must have given him some incredible business talents for him to do that. In any case, he, he told me how law enforcement was after him or whatever. I don't think he served time. I don't think they ever caught him. I certainly didn't ask for his name. Uh, and he wasn't dealing anything at the present time. He, uh, because he's, he, was, he wasn't hitting me up for money, but he was, you know, telling me it was tight for him financially. 
which obviously if he was currently dealing drugs, it wouldn't have been t- tight for him or he would have been using, and he was not using. So, uh, so w- 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 the point is, the devil can download business talent to people when they do, when they get involved in evil and criminal enterprises. So let's always remember, if the devil can supernaturally download business talents in people, okay, for the devil's purposes, which is always glamorized and shown in the movies, Scorsese, I think, is a great director, but let's not kid ourselves, he glamorizes organized crime and that whole thing. Let's not be, let's not, let's not, like, deceive ourselves. He's a talented man, Martin Scorsese, the director, but he he glamorizes uh, organized crime and people in organized crime families. Okay, so, but back to this young man. So, the devil can download talents and abilities into people. And they, you know, don't think for a moment that like the street gangs and the drug gangs and the sex trafficking and all these other criminal enterprises, they're highly organized. Let's just talk about the, the, the gangs. I mean, they're organized. You say, how, would, how do you know they're organized? Because I did a lot of research in my book. Uh, the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. I go into a lot about the MS-13 gang, which started in Los Angeles. And in the book, I, I talk about their start in Los Angeles because there's a reason why I include them in the book, The Greatest Battle. And uh, they began getting involved in Satanism. Well, at first they got involved in heavy metal, and because some of the heavy metal bands were involved in Satanism, then MS-13 got involved in Satanism. So, they're, they're using satanic energy, satanic sacrifices and rituals to get their power, and I talk about it and expose it in the book. But a lot of people don't know, and um, I talk about it in, in the book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, that the MS-13 gang is the largest employer. And I, I'm trying to remember what I put in my own book, and I can never remember the name of the nation. Uh, they're the largest employer in a South American nation. And they have, well, let's see, I have a chapter entitled In the Greatest Battle. On Starting at page 151, the chapter is entitled 18 Drug-Fueled Days of Terror, Sexual Assault, and Satanic Murder. And then, as I get into the this, into this story, let me read you some documentation that I have from my book. Um, Both the MS-13 and the 18th Street Gangs began in Los Angeles, California, and employ some 60,000 Salvadorians between them, making them the largest employers in the nation of El Salvador. Look, you may be involved in Satanism and drugs and meth and God knows what else, and those crazy, and those like satanic tattoos, but... That is, an, that is an organization. That is a business enterprise. Violent, demonic, it's a business enterprise. You don't get to be the largest employer uh, in the nation of El Salvador with 60,000 Salvadorians. Okay? Um, you know, that's not a mom and pop operation. And in my book, The Greatest Battle, I have documentation from the FBI. According to the FBI National Gang Threat Assessment Report, more than 1.4 million Americans are still wearing the colors 
which are the clothing that signifies you're part of a gang. So 1.4 million Americans are still wearing their, quote, gang collars that signifies they're part of a gang. That's a lot of people. And, and by the way, they are heavily armed with automatic assault rifles and God knows what. They are heavily armed. Okay? So you think of the implications of 1.4 million people heavily armed. And you're waiting for your uh, alarm system to respond or something. Just do the math. Do the math. And there are, according to the FBI, there are more than 33,000 gangs across the United States. And the FBI says the gangs commit 48% of violent crime and are becoming more dangerous as each day goes by. So, I, I get into that, and then I get into the origination of the gangs and the connection between heavy metal, metal and Satanism, etc., etc. So when I say to you, Satan can download business and organizational talents from people. I'm serious. But the, but the point is, and this is what I wanted to stress, God is not cheap. God is not stingy. God is never second rate to Satan. God is love. God, Jesus Christ, is King of kings and Lord of lords. And so if, the, the, if Lucifer will give you certain talents and abilities, how much more will the true God, Jesus Christ, the biblical God, how much more generous will he be in downloading into people who ask him with the right motive? How much more generous will the true God be, Jesus Christ, in giving people talents and abilities and business organizational giftings and entrepreneurship and cash flow and money and solving problems and giving you favor and opening doors? If, if we're going to measure uh, the, the, the kingdom of darkness with Lucifer as the head, and we're going to compare it to the kingdom of light with Jesus Christ as, as King of kings and Lord of lords. Which, which kingdom? The kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light is more powerful? The kingdom of light. Who is more generous? Who will download more talents and abilities and giftings? The kingdom of light. The kingdom of Jesus. It's just that he wants to make sure that the people he's downloading all these blessings to are doing it for the right motive so they don't become evil. You see, we are in the greatest competition and spiritual battle in the history of the world. For crying out loud, I feel like standing on a rooftop with a bullhorn and a sound. No, not a bullhorn. That's not loud enough. I'd like to stand on the top of a building in downtown LA or New York and have a sound system rigged up on, on, on the building, aimed down at, at masses of people that's louder than, than the, the, the loudest, most intense sound system for a heavy metal band playing in, in a Super Bowl-sized stadium. Just, just to, to grab attention. Except preach the gospel with power and truth and tell the people about the goodness of God. Oh yeah, they think you're crazy, but you get a lot of media coverage. Because there's this lie, you see, there's this lie that's being perpetuated in the film industry and the culture, etc. You got a classic example. I was sitting, speaking of stadiums, I was sitting in Dodger Stadium a number of years ago uh, taking my son to watch uh, a, a Dodgers game, and uh, uh, Jay Z, you know the the hip hop entrepreneur, Beyonce's husband, and he is known for his power, his success, his marketing ability, et cetera, et cetera, and and. There's millions of young people, white and black, who want to imitate him. They want to be just like Jay-Z, you know? So, they're all the, the families are there in the stadium and others are there. 
And the TV does a close-up on Jay-Z, of course, probably pre-arranged publicity. And, and Jay-Z's looking real cool, you know, smoking a cigar and uh, kicking back in like a little more private seating area. And he flashes with his hands the, 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 the goat horn symbol, which is the, the, the hand sign of Satan or Satanism. And his T-shirt says, and you can see it really clearly. Everybody in that stadium could see it. It was up on the giant screen televisions in the baseball stadium. Do what thou wilt, which is Aleister Crowley, the great Satanist's most famous slogan, which means do whatever you feel like doing. That's the law of Satanism. Do what thou wilt. It's the total opposite of God's commandments. In Satanism, you have no restrictions. Whatever you want to do, no matter how sinful or evil, do it. That's what that says if you tear apart the meaning of the word, do what thou wilt. And so, Jay-Z is functioning as a marketing man for Satan and the powers of darkness. I mean, I'm not making this up. I, I talk about it in my book, The Greatest Battle. And I talk about it in my other book, um, A Prophecy of the Future of America. I get into much further detail about Beyonce and Jay-Z, etc. And the satanic connections. So, he's a walking advertisement for Satanism. And when young people see it, and they see the money, the power, the success, the fame, the sex, they, they, it's, it's tempting. They, they, want, they want that. So there's a competition between the kingdom of light and Jesus Christ and Satan and Lucifer and his kingdom. And there are people, and there are angels that have chosen to be part of Satan's side, fallen angels that are demons, and there are angels that have chosen to be on God's side, God's angels, and people who have chosen to be on God's side, people who have chosen to follow God. And if your motive is right, and I teach this in the book, A Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016-2017, ignore the date on the book. I shouldn't have put the expiration date there it's because the, the teaching in it doesn't end in two, didn't end in 2017. It's really volume two of Prophecy of the Future of America, the first book. This is the sequel to it, Prophecy of the Future of America, 2016-2017, where I teach intensively about how it is the desire of God and the will of God based on Scripture. He wants to download and equip his people, his servants, with, yes, wealth, money, power, whatever they need to get the job done of uh, preaching the gospel and, and whatever God has called them to do. Now, no, I'm not preaching. Let's just take a deep breath. I'm not teaching a prosperity gospel. I'm not teaching people that God's desire is to make everybody rich and fly a jumbo jet. Okay, that's false teaching. But what I am saying is, if the ordinary man or ordinary woman, especially young people, because young people are all about trying to discover their identity, whether they know it or not, young people are on, on, a, on a passionate search to discover their true identity. It's, it's like a primal thing. And by the way, in, in the book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, I have numerous chapters that deal with God's principles of identity and the, the supernatural revelation of identity and how from finding your identity as God created you, it releases power and enables you to be victorious in life. I talk a lot about identity. Why? Because it's, it's the primal force that people don't openly discuss it, but it's a driving force that begins when you're young. So, like, so, so like people are make, making decisions, and they're, like, they're, they're looking at the evidence of the fruits of, hey, gee, this is what Satan will give me if I follow him, because you've got Jay-Z and many others openly saying they're Satanists, and you can see what they got. 
And then there's God's people or people who follow God. And, and, and people are checking both kingdoms out, forgetting that Satan is a liar. And what you see is not what you really get with Satan. Satan is all about seduction and lying and promises. So, so you see, even if Satan has the most exciting advertising campaign and the most exciting and dynamic people marketing his kingdom and trying to recruit people into his kingdom, I mean, Satan is all about trying to get young men and women and people to sell their souls to Satan. And the final manifestation of that, according to the Bible, is when the Antichrist is revealed and he will be indwelt by Satan and the false prophet will come along who has a one-world economic system and a one-world religion, the Antichrist, Satan, and the false prophet, they will distribute the mark of the beast, 666, the microchip or whatever form of implant. And you cannot get or receive that mark of the beast or the chip implant Unless, according to the book of Revelation, you pledge to reject Jesus Christ as Lord and you pledge to worship the Antichrist or Satan as God, which essentially means you're selling your soul to Satan. In order to get the mark of the beast, you're in in essence selling your soul to Satan. Then you can participate in the the global economic system, etc. See, so you see where this goes? And you got to know Bible prophecy to understand it. So people are going to be deceived because remember, Satan is a liar. How do we know that? Because that's what he did with Adam and Eve. Remember, Adam and Eve started out in paradise where everything was perfect, everything was wonderful. In addition to that, Adam and Eve were given supernatural authority and power by God. They functioned as kings and queens of planet Earth. They had it all. That tells you what God has in mind for his people. So the devil, in the form of a serpent, comes up to Adam and Eve, and he lies to them and seduces them and basically says, God's holding out on you. And if you disobey God and eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, you're going to become like God, or gods. It was all a lie. When they listened to Satan and rejected God's word, a curse came on them. They lost paradise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Satan is a liar. He always prom- all these people that are selling their souls to Satan today in the entertainment industry and stuff, and glamorizing Satanism and stuff. It's all a lie. It's all a lie. It's the same thing with socialism, Marxism, and communism. Oh, yeah, you're going to have everything. We're going to give complete social justice. We're going to take care of all your needs. You're going to have the most exciting job, and everybody's going to get paid the same. We'll all be rich. We'll all be having this incredible lifestyle once we go socialist, Marxist, or communist. Man, it's going to be the greatest thing there ever is. Really interesting. That's all a lie. I just happened to, this morning, as I was taking care of some paperwork, I was watching a leftist uh, uh, satellite TV channel called Democracy Now! And, but they, even though they're leftists, they gave a very honest documentary film report of the Chinese massacre in Tiananmen Square which I believed happened in 1989. And for those of you who may know about it or, or don't know about it, remember, China is a hardcore communist country. And the communist revolutionary leader who, who brought it into communist communism was Chairman Mao. And Rockefeller loved Chairman Mao, which, by the way, I, I tell the whole secret story in my book, The Greatest Battle. You need to read what Rockefeller had to say about Chairman Mao and the relationship between Rockefeller and China and that whole communist revolution. You need to understand what really happened happened because it's happening now. Anyway, I think Chairman Mao in 1989 had died. I believe he died by then. But the communists were still on power like they are now. So 
for the first time since, the, and by the way, when Chairman Mao was leading the communist revolution, he killed or starved to death somewhere around 100 million people. They always lie about the true numbers. He was evil beyond evil. And that's document. I have documentation for that. So, uh, China was under, and still is under, a hardcore totalitarian, that's where socialism goes, by the way, communist uh, regime. So in 1989, the, stu- the young people started to rebel against the, the, the dictatorship of communism, and they began to demand freedom. So they began to pro- protest in Tiananmen Square, which, which is this important historical open area in, in, in China. And there's a gigantic monument and, and painting type thing of Chairman Mao, the, the communist revolutionary, et cetera, et cetera. And it's always patrolled heavily by communist Chinese soldiers. So for months, the communist Chinese youth, I mean, they were youth of the communist Chinese, kept protesting. They wanted the same kind of freedoms we have in the United States of America. And they would chant and and make posters and say this openly. And the communist Chinese kept threatening, the government kept threatening them and threatening them and threatening them. But nobody expected in their worst nightmare to happen what I'm about to tell you. Nobody was prepared for it. Nobody ever thought that the kind of communist Chinese government would do this to their own children. And as they kept protesting for freedom and defying the communist Chinese army and government, the students finally marched into the Tiananmen Square with this giant statue uh, of the Statue of Liberty, you know, chanting that they wanted freedom like in the United States. And then the communist Chinese government moved in soldiers, young soldiers, girls and boys, the same age as the student demonstrators. And they opened, fired, and massacred, and killed, I don't know how many thousands of Chinese students. They sent in tanks, machine guns, guns. And they murdered and killed in cold blood in front of numerous cameras filming it. They slaughtered in a bloodbath their own young people, the communist Chinese students. They slaughtered them by the thousands. And that was it. Since 1989 to the present moment, there's, there's no freedom there. But there's economic freedom to some degree. But you, can't, you have no freedom of speech, no freedom of religion, no freedom of the press. They cracked, they, didn't, they just, they did what dictatorships do. And this is, by the way, not just happened in communist China, it's happened in Cuba and happened in Russia, it happens in all communist nations. It's where socialism always goes. So the point is, just like Satan who told Adam and Eve you were going to get paradise. Remember, what's what's the big thing that the the, the communists always use the the expression, we're going to bring in a worker's paradise, you know? But it never happens. It always becomes a dictatorship. Because communism, like Satanism, is built on lies and seduction. That's how Satan operates. That's how how Satan gets people on his side. I am listening to something on on the news. And I don't know who said it. I think it was a politician. And this particular politician shouts out, and I couldn't believe it, the words, workers of the world unite. And I, I... My mouth hangs open. I'm stunned. Because Workers of the World Unite is a famous, famous, famous communist slogan invented by Karl Marx, the the, the, the creator of the Communist Manifesto. Workers of the World Unite is is like the most famous of all communist slogans. It's being said by a 
an American politician, and I'm stunned. And the reason I'm stunned is because, like, what is this person? Do they have some? Do they have their memory erased through shock treatment or something? Is their memory erased? Do they not know that every time the workers of the world have united and had their communist revolution, that it always, without exception, ends in mass slaughter, a bloodbath, and the total taking away of all the people's freedoms? And there is no workers' paradise, and there is no social justice. It never materializes. That's why these communist students in 1989 were demonstrating by the hundreds of thousands in Tiananmen Square. And, and, and just, it's amazing. So you see, when, when there is a vacuum of truth, which means there's, not, there's no truth, it's empty, that is the, the, that's, the envi- that, that's when the, the Bible talks about the dry places and the demons and Satan always go to the dry places. That means those are the places spiritually that are empty. They're like a vacuum. And that's the demons like that because the, the, that they can comfortably stay in those places. The presence of God is not in those places. So when, when you have generations of people and masses of people that are empty and hollow inside, they are easy to fill with the lies of Satan and and great demonic destruction can happen in in those types of places, even in America. If any lesson we should know is that what happened in Tenement Square could eventually happen in America if the right By right, I mean the wrong sequence of events were to ever happen. Don't think we're immune from the the dangers that any other nation has faced just because we're Americans. That's a very naive and silly belief. So how do you you guard yourself against that? You've got to have your eyes open, not be seduced by lies. And you have to recognize that we're in the last days, and we are in the greatest sp- spiritual battle. There is a spiritual battle for the hearts and minds of mankind raging in people's hearts and minds right now. And what they see and what they think and what's in the media, it all matters. It all adds up. But the good news is, because of the internet and the existence of alternative media, there has been enough truth like salt and light sprinkled in our society where now for the first time you have younger generations of people who are open. They're open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're open to the warnings of the book of Revelation. And they're open. And they don't have that minds that are shut, you know. When people shut down their minds and any thought or idea that isn't part of the official brainwashing, if you will, they are not going to just reject it like a bunch of robots. They don't have robot brains. But I found by just talking to people, especially younger generations everywhere, is that they may not know Jesus, but they're open. They're open like never before they're open. So the key is what Jesus Christ said, that the the fields are white for harvest. And the biggest antidote from evil spreading is to spread goodness, which comes from God. If you saturate the hearts of the people of America and other nations with the goodness of God and the truth of God and the love of God, and the principles of God, that functions as strengthening the immune system against the spiritual disease and infections of the satanic kingdom. See, people don't entertain the the lies of the devil, the seductions of the devil. They don't entertain that. They don't open themselves up to it if they're filled with the truth and the word of God. But in order for them to be filled with the truth in the Word of God, somebody has to go around sowing the truth 
and the Word of God. Somebody has to go around sowing that seed strategically and deliberately into the hearts and souls of men and women. That's the job of the church and Christians. That's the job of ministries like this one. That's what we do at Paul McGuire Ministries in Paradise Mountain Church. Everything you see or hear that we do, every one of these Paul McGuire Report audio programs or people watching our programs or watching our videos or reading our articles or reading the books or spreading the links, etc., etc., has the effect of sowing the seed of God's word and God's truth in the hearts and minds of people. That is the primary antidote against uh, America uh, being seduced by evil. Because look, I'm going to I'm going to be I'm going to be very direct. You, if you if you think you can take your freedoms for granted, you are deceived. Your freedoms are being challenged right now. Okay. If this battle between good and evil is lost, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what's going to happen. We are at a pivotal moment where we still are in a position where we can choose which pathway we're going to walk down as individuals or as a nation. But this pivotal moment is not going to stay, the door for this moment is not going to stay open forever. History teaches us that, that the, just like the seasons change, people's hearts will change either for good or bad. This door can be preserved open and we can move in the right direction, assuming enough seed is planted in the hearts and souls of men and women. The seed of the gospel, the seed of a biblical worldview, the seed of evangelism, the seed of Bible prophecy. But on the other side, if all these seeds of darkness continue to be planted, then we'll move in that direction. This is why I wrote my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. It's because there is in me, just like there is in you, through the Holy Spirit, this never-ending, 24-7, acute awareness, this constant reminder that goes off in any soul where your conscience is alive. There's a 24-7 conscience re- a, a reminder in your conscience that, that the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. That's what, look at the back of my book, the photo. The, the, the cover photo on the back of The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. Just look at the cover photo. Go to paulmcguire.us. Look at the cover photo in the back of the book. And look at the clock of which I'm standing underneath. That's where we are in Bible prophecy time. So this is this is a moment in time that we have to seize this moment in time because it's a gift from God. If we fail to seize the moment in time and we fail to obey the Lord Jesus Christ, then we cannot, in turn, blame Jesus Christ for what potentially can happen. Now, if that bothers you, I'm sorry, but I'd rather temporarily bother you with the anticipation that we can spread revival and spread God's word and, in effect, preempt, be proactive against the plans of darkness, and spread and ignite a biblical revival. A biblical revival, not built around any man, but built around Jesus Christ and his word. And spread that revival and feed that revival, because people are hungering by the millions, but they have to be reached. So I want to thank you, every one of you who are prayer warriors for this ministry, myself, my family. Continue on in your prayers. Thank you for spreading the links and be more aggressive in spreading the links strategically. <clears throat> Thank you as you seek the Lord and obey Him in terms of your financial contributions and your donations, which enable this ministry to continue and 
will enable our ministry to expand and accelerate its outreach with the game plan of being more effective, getting the message to more people, seeing more uh, salvations, more truth spread in our society. Because it's not, you know, it's not just about sending out a message that doesn't produce any results. It's about being effective in your message so it reaches the hearts of people and causes changes. I believe that the Word of God is true. With all things, God, everything's possible with God. And remember this, God is not cheap. God is not stingy. The devil is not more generous than God. It's just that God wants to make sure before he blesses supernaturally. Read the story of King Solomon. God blesses King Solomon because King Solomon's motive was pleasing to God. King Solomon's motive was not all about, Lord, make me rich because I want to be rich and famous. No. King Solomon's motive was that he might lead God's people rightly. And God said in response to to Solomon's prayer, he said, because you didn't ask me for wealth and money just, just for yourself, because you didn't ask me wisdom just for yourself, he said, I'm going to give you more money than you possibly, and wealth than you possibly could ever have believed for. And I'll make you the wisest man that ever lived. So God made Solomon the wealthiest man that ever lived and the wisest man that ever lived because of his motive. It was right. It was to do what God wanted to do. And a lot of times our prayers are obstructed because God, what he wants is, yeah, it's fine to pray the prayers. But we need to examine our hearts to make sure that our motive is right before the Lord. And if it is, God will answer the prayers miraculously. So on that note, I want to encourage you to keep praying and, if, and examine your heart. And if your heart needs to be changed, ask God to change it. Ask God to change it. Just, just go to the Lord and ask him to change your heart. All things are possible with God. But, but remember, we can fool ourselves, but we can't fool God. But it's God's desire to bless and protect and deliver his people. That's God's desire. God is good. But he's waiting for us. God bless you on Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. God bless you on Paul McGuire. Yeah.